Viewer. I'm your host Candace Blanks and this is the first show coming back from the pandemic and I'm telling you God is so awesome. We're here in the land of the living but to, on today's show we have an awesome woman of God. She's a minister, she's a producer, she's a writer, she's a director, she's all the above and she's a gospel artist. And I am so happy to interview her because she's not only all of those things, but she's also a great friend. you I man you just don't know I am so oh my goodness I'm so excited to interview you because I have known you for so many years and to hear your testimony it, it gives me goosebumps every time I hear it so tell me and we're just gonna jump right into it if that's okay with you that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> tell me what what made you get into the writings? Because you are so many things and you're in the media so so much. So tell me, what, what made you get into the writings? Well, Candace, believe it or not, well, first of all, let me back up. Let me say, I'm excited to be here with you. <laughs> uh, you are like my laughing buddy and my encouragement buddy. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here with you. But uh, what made me get into writing was, uh, as a kid, I was bullied. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when you're bullied and you're the only kid, um, the parents have the tendency to be busy about life. Yes. And so I had to find an outlet. And so that outlet for me became music and writing. Wow. Yeah. So so you talk about your childhood. How was your childhood growing up? Uh, my, my childhood, uh, the best word I could put it was estranged. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, my dad died when I was three. I found mm, him um, dead. And um, that began a spiral for me. You know, um, of depression, oppression, uh, even to the point of trying to commit suicide at 12 years old um, because I felt like nobody loved me, nobody wanted me, nobody cared, and nobody heard the silent screams that was happening on the inside. Wow. So there might be somebody's watching that might say, hey, listen, I, I'm going through that now. What would you say to them? I would say that, you know, for me, if it would have just been somebody there that I could have talked to, that mm -hmm. could have come to minister to that place of hurt, right? Yeah. That little girl that was crying out for help. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have uh, that safe haven where we're able to go and talk to someone. So basically a support system. And I would say that's the best way to get out of those dark places. So so did your, your mom, um, did she realize you were going through all these things? Um, my mom was just, you know, she became a widow uh, because he died, you know, when I was three. And then on top of that, she was trying to maintain the house. So my mom was pretty busy working. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure that she probably noticed signs, but she was so busy working that she didn't really understand the full impact that it was having on me at that moment. So now you're, you know, of course you're older and you're an adult. Yes. Um, when she hear these things, like what 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 did she say, or what what is her uh, viewpoint on you like your story that you know untold story? Oh uh, well, you know for years we went back and forth, you know because it was a, a strange relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to say because I'm saying this for someone that God came along and healed it. And there was a moment where we sat on the phone and I said, Mama, when this happened and that happened, this hurt me. And she began to apologize. And she didn't realize the impact that it had. You know, so God is still in that process of healing certain parts of our relationship. But I can say that God has brought us a, lot, a long way. Amen. Amen. Yes. So, so all of those who are watching, especially parents, 
you know, take a close look at your children. Um, watch the signs. Watch the signs. Watch their body language. You know, because uh, nowadays, because of the pandemic, a lot of kids are going through depression and suicidal thoughts. And, you know, not just kids, but adults as well. That's right. And so make sure that you watch what's going on. You don't, you don't want it to get out of hand. And so, you know, it, I know we all go to work and we're all busy, but watch the signs that your kids are giving screaming out for help you call it silent screams silent screams oh like that that's an interesting verbiage yes. <laughs> why do you call it a silent scream uh, because a lot of times when kids are going through depression oppression suppression uh, they're being bullied a lot of times they don't have that outlet to to verbalize it or the outlet half of the time is not fully listening to the problem behind what they're saying yeah um, and so that becomes a silent scream on the inside because you're saying mm -hmm. silently I'm trying to tell you what's going on but okay in the inside I have to internalize this so I'm screaming on the inside mm -hmm. and, and that comes out in, in different forms right yeah. promiscuousness uh, going out smoking cigarettes going out hanging out with the wrong crowd mm -hmm. but they're really silently screaming asking God for help Wow, so so basically the outer things that they're doing is caused from the inner things that are happening on the inside. Correct. Oh, wow, yes. man. Yes. I, I hope you got that out there. See, your kids, you you like, oh, my child is bad. No, your child is not bad. Your child is actually giving you a sign that they need to, to talk to someone. They need to communicate with you about what's going on on the inside of them. That's good. So, so you need to take a real close look. Stop calling your kids bad because they are what you call them. That's right. Okay, oh, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> that part, right? So, in saying that, that silent scream, and and like I said, she was a she's a director and a producer. You have a play that's called Silent Scream Shattered Pieces. Yes. So, tell me more about the shattered pieces side of it. Uh, so a lot of times when we go through trauma and tribulations, we find ourselves scattered, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, even the Bible talks about how God has scattered the pieces of Israel. And so a lot of times when we're going through different things, yeah. there, there are uh, things that come in our life that s scatter us. Yeah. And so basically... Uh, when we get into relationships yeah. and we have sex with people, they take pieces of us. Oh, talk a, talk a little bit about that. Because maybe somebody out there, they might have or and or continually right. having sex. And what do you mean that you're scattering yourself, scattering those pieces of you? Right. So basically, uh, we know that a woman is basically an incubator for whatever the seed is that's placed in, right? Mm. So when that man comes and he has sex with you, you're not only sleeping with him, but you're sleeping with the other women that he slept with. Mm. And so when he leaves you, he's taking a piece of you because you opened up and gave yourself to him. Wow. You thought that maybe he was your promise, right? Mm. And so um, he leaves away with a piece of you. Yeah. And so for those women that are out there being promiscuous. Like yeah. that's uh, that was also a part of my testimony, but it wasn't for me, men, it was women. But mm. now we're we're going into this promiscuous phase where Jane has a piece of you and and Sally has a piece of you and oh. Ken has a piece of you because you sat in the bed with them and you decided to bring in yourself into a covenant because marriage is a covenant and that's yeah. the that's the consummation of it, right? Yeah. So we have a covenant with these people. Yeah. And so now they have pieces of us. And so now we're in Nebraska and Arkansas and Tennessee and oh, <laughs> Alabama, wow. you know. Yeah. And, and you, when you come in Christ, you know, it's I, I'm saying this to somebody because uh, once you come in Christ, you have to realize, okay, now that, that these pieces are over the place, God, bring me back together. Mm. Bring wholeness back to my life. Yeah. You know, and so that's the part about this play. Like, we're talking about all those issues, sleeping with wrong people, having rape, or having wrong relationships and situations, but now we're bringing the pieces back together mm -hmm. where those pieces have been shattered or scattered or because of trauma, you know, losing someone, you've been sh shattered. Yeah. And now we're bringing those pieces back together, and the person that can make you whole is who? God. God. Come on now. Come on, miss. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you definitely... You're definitely um, um, 
when we come back after these messages, I want you to talk more about, you said, for you, it was women. Yes. So when we come back after this message, I want you to expound on that a little bit more, okay? Zion here talking about her life situations, her life story, and we're definitely want to know. You said previously that um, for you it was women right. that you had to, that you were dealing with. So talk to us more about that. Uh, for me, it was it was finding the identity. That's what led me to women, finding mm -hmm. the identity. Uh, when Dad died at three, yeah. Uh, he left me without identity. Mm. You see, the father is the one that gives you the, the identity. He pours into you. He tells you, you're beautiful. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are who God said that you are. He begins to shape and mold the identity of his daughter. Woo, stop Boy. right there. <laughs> that, that's a mouthful within itself because I, I want men to understand what you just said. You said the father is who gives the identity to the young girl. That's right. So you for, for those fathers who are watching this show, if you have daughters, you are to give your daughter their identity, yes. uplift them, encourage them, speak into their lives. That's correct. But because your father was not there, yes. then you lost that identity, That's that right. part of it. Okay, go on. Oh my goodness. So, uh, so dad was in there, and then grandfather died not too long after. So all the guys. So all the men left. Oh my so uh, be because of what I was beginning to see at home, yeah. mom was trying to work. She became a little angry, a little bitter, yeah. you know, a little resentful towards yeah. certain things. Yeah. Um, and then my mom. This is another thing. She would always say, "I need to ask my husband." She was talking about me. So another thing is like as parents we have to be careful what we say about our kids or what we speak over our kids mm. because now you're opening me opening me up to something that I was never supposed to be opened up to. Oh come on, right? Now. And so um, with that happening, I, I begin to say, okay, well maybe I'm a, maybe I'm supposed to be a male mm. so because I started battling the the identity crisis started happening. Yeah. So the enemy used that as a footstool and say, hey, I'm gonna come on all the way in and I, I'm gonna use her as one of my best, you know? And that's what began to happen. So at the age of 16, I embraced the homosexual lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that homosexual lifestyle led me for probably about 10 years into this lifestyle. Wow. And um, I, all I can say is, I'm trying not to cry, but all I can say is nobody but God that actually, that actually allowed me to escape it. Wow. Talk to us more about that. What, you, what do you mean? How, like, how did you get out of that, that lifestyle? Um, so I'll never forget my grandmother, my grandmother passed um, the day after my birthday. Mm. And uh, my grandmother was my everything. She was my... My best friend, we did basically, you know, a whole bunch of stuff together. Uh, and so I didn't grieve at her funeral. Like, I was cold because I'm like, I'm in shock. I'm in denial that she's gone. I'm, I'm looking to pick the phone up and she answers. Yeah. And so it took me about two months later. I found myself, um, the girl that I was dating at the time, she was sitting on the sofa. I was sitting on the sofa. And the preacher, he came on and he was screaming and he was talking about Jesus. You know, I don't know if you ever remember the screaming preacher, but, um, <laughs> but he was talking about Jesus, and um, I feel like God put her in a dead sleep, and there was such a wailing that came over me. There was such a um, a presence that began to hit the living room, mm -hmm. and I found myself crying and weeping for probably about three hours straight. Wow. And after that, um, there was a woman at my job, and she said, God has a call on your life. She met me in the bathroom. And she said, God has a call on your life. And she began to minister to me about God. 
Now, previously I had known about God from Catholic Church to, to Baptist Church, but it was like, okay, something's weird yeah. or whatever. But in that moment, God began to meet me. Yeah. And um, I remember just packing my stuff. While the person I was in a relationship with, I packed my stuff and I said, okay, I'm out. And it took everything in me, but there was a strength that was there. Yeah. And going back to that estranged relationship, yeah. this was the beginning where God used my mom. Because she told me, two grown women can't live in the same house, so I left. But then she said, and I knew it was God, in that moment she said, you can come back here. Wow. Man. Yeah. Man, God is awesome. <laughs> so to those people who, who are watching and says, you know what? I'm in that situation. I'm living like this. I want to be free. I want to get out. God is your answer. All you have to do is come to him and he will give you everything that you need. Yeah. We're going to be right back after these messages. you're just now tuning in we're interviewing miss giselle watts as we know her zion thank you again for coming on the show thank you so much i'm really really i'm been blessed by your testimony so far because you know just to hear it again you know it's, it's refreshing because i know the person i see today like wow you went through all of this as a young age, because I cannot imagine losing a father, losing a grandfather, losing the men in your life. And then your your mother saying, you know, to you, you know, every time she has to make decisions, I got to, you know, speak to my husband. And she's referring to you. And that's, that's opening up your spirit for a homosexual lifestyle because you thought that, hey, well, maybe God made a mistake. Right. right, right. Um, as I um, looked into your play, Silent Scream Shatter Pieces, I saw so many different um, areas of ministry in um, that play, and it talks about so many avenues of abuse. So can you talk to more, us more about that? Yeah, so uh, Silent Scream Shatter Pieces, we definitely we, we deal with different levels of abuse, right? So we, we deal with uh, the one that's been raped in college. Yes. Because you have a lot of women that have their testimony and men. Yes. Um, we also deal with, uh, you know, a piece of my testimony as well. Uh, because we have a lot of people that, or in church and out of church, that's still dealing with that. Uh, and then uh, we also deal with the, the drug addiction, yes. HIV. Um, we we want to hit from every aspect. Because one of the things that's happening in the church house is that we so busy focusing on money and we're focusing on the numbers that we forget about the fact that we need to focus on the soul of the man. Mm, that's good. And and when focusing on the soul of, of a man, um, a lot of people like, what, what does she mean by that? <laughs> so, so basically what I mean is, is we need to focus on the soulless realm. And the soulless realm has the houses the emotions. It houses uh, the different things that you've experienced, the psychological traumas that you've experienced. Mama walking out, daddy not being there. Um, when when best friend died or when grandmother died, you know, or when you went through that trauma with the, yeah. the HIV or um, maybe you got raped uh, or molested by someone that you actually cared about. Yeah, that's something you know that we we deal with because. If they're not going to deal with it over the pulpit, yeah. it's our responsibility uh, as those that are actors and writers and producers to deal with it from a Christian perspective that people can get set free, healed, and delivered. Amen. And you know, that is what healing for the broken is. Is that, you know, you always used to hear hurt people hurt people, but no, heal people. Heal people, you know, and that is why this show is, is, is the reason why God has created this show is that so we can heal those people who are needing to be healed. You might say, 
I am in that situation. You might be screaming through your TV right now saying, that is me. Okay. That is me. What? How do I find this God that you're talking about? You know, how do I get to that point? And I'm telling you, Romans 10, 9 and 10. It's the best place to start. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Jesus died and rose again. You shall be saved. That's That's the confess your sins. Confess that you made a mistake. We are human. We have made mistakes. We've been through some things. We're not perfect. Even as believers, we're still not perfect. See, you know what? A lot of times people say, well, you're a Christian. You're supposed to be perfect. No, no, we're human that are Christians. That's right. <laughs> so we make mistakes, but we got the ability to go to God and ask Him for forgiveness. That's right. So speaking of forgiveness, Uh-oh. talk to us more about forgiveness. Who all that you had to forgive to go through this process of being a healed Zion today? Oh, I really, it was a long list. You know, but the the top of that list, it had to start with me. I had to forgive myself uh, for allowing situations, not having boundaries in place. And, and that's also another thing, you know, even as a kid, uh, relationships teach you boundaries. Mm-hmm. And so as an adult, I had, to, I had to go back and learn how to have boundaries with yeah. people. Um, so there were a couple of people that I had to forgive, you know, from, from mother to father. Uh, and then on top of that, the people that came along and violated certain places in my life, I had to learn how to forgive them um, and to release them and to let them go. And then to realize, okay, after releasing them and let them go, you know, a lot of people get this wrong that when you forgive somebody and you say, I forgive you, that you still leave them in that space. Mm. But a lot of times, sometimes... When you forgive them, yeah. you got to say, okay, I forgive you, but you can't be in my space any longer. Yeah. You know, so. And, and, and you said forgive your father, but you were young. And he passed away. Like, a lot of people was like, why, why should you forgive your father? I had to forgive him because, I, because there was a part of me that felt like um, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't valuable enough. Uh, mm-hmm. That it was my fault that he left. Uh, that it was my fault that he abandoned me, that he decided to commit suicide. I took on the burden and the responsibility, and I had to forgive him because I felt like he just copped out. Like he just mm-hmm. he just exited out. He pumped out of life. Wow. And I had to realize that everybody has their own demons to fight. Wow. But your choice is, are you going to fight those demons with God, or are you going to fight those demons by yourself? Say that again. Are you going to fight those demons with God or are you going to fight them by yourself? Are you going to fight those demons with God or are you going to fight those demons by yourself? See, the choice is yours. And you have that decision today to fight with God or you can say, you know what, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I'm, I think I'm going to do this on my own because I promise you it's a lot harder doing it by yourself. Been doing it with God. See, I'm, oh my goodness. Thank you, Zion, for coming on this show to give your testimony because a lot of people need to hear that you went through homosexuality. You went through watching your dad commit suicide because you could have, you could easily went crazy. A lot of things have, have went on in your life that you could have easily went crazy about. So, Tell me more. Did you did you happen to go to counseling? Like, you know, nine times out of ten, mental health counseling, a lot of people don't want to go to it nowadays, right? You know, they're like, oh, I ain't telling nobody my business. Did you actually go through counseling to get delivered or what happened to you in that point of, of switching over? You know, because that's a lot of stuff to, to endure. Process. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, let me say, if it had not been... <laughs> And and I'm not being like, oh, I'm just saying it's truth. If it had not been for the goodness and the grace of God, I sure not would not be sitting here. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, counseling for me uh, looked like counselors telling me I needed Prozac. I needed this. I needed Mm -hmm. Retlin. Um, As a kid, my mom took me to counseling. And then um, as an adult, I went to counseling. And the lady sat across from me and she said, baby, she said, there's nothing wrong with you. You just have things that you need to process through. And so that was that was um, that moment for me was key because a lot of times people are quick to label you 
mm-hmm. without actually taking the time to actually understand the silent scream on the inside, but she did. Wow. Um, and then later on through life, um, as I grew up, I realized that there were certain issues and certain things that I was experiencing or going through yeah. that I needed to have a counselor. And so I did go back to counseling later on in life, um, and that counselor helped me tremendously. So I just want to encourage somebody else. You know, a lot of times in the church house we say counseling is not for the Christian. No, counseling, God gives us wisdom. But also he gives those that have been through schooling wisdom as well to be able to help us. Amen. And so when, when, when you hear there was nothing wrong with you at that moment, Mm -hmm. what went through your mind? Oh, it, it, it kind of was a shock because my whole life, you know, it, it was different things that were being labeled and being said about me. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that, yeah. you know, you out here, you're being fast. So you out here and you're, you're doing this or uh, you're not good enough or you're not, you know, be this and that this, you know. And so those labels had begun to stuck and that became part of what I started to identify myself as. But when she said there's nothing wrong with you and you need to process out of this thing by having somebody to actually help you walk through these situations, I was like, hmm, nothing wrong with me. Mm. That's not what I was told the whole, you know. Wow. So, yeah. Mm. There might be somebody saying that same thing is happening to me. What would you tell them? Um, you can, you can. I would, I would, I would tell them that God is truly like the best counselor. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times when when you go to people, especially people that don't have your best interests at heart, mm-hmm. uh, they have a tendency to label you. But God is the best counselor. Yeah, uh, He's the one that will give you the wisdom and the strategy to say, okay, daughter or son. I need you to go and talk to this person, and that person will have words of wisdom uh, in their mouth to help you through that season. And and sometimes, as Christians, we have those moments, yeah. you know, where we just really need someone to talk to. So that once again, that's going back into having that accountability or having that uh, support team around you. Yes. Oh, that is awesome! That is awesome. Listen, I grew up um, where mental illness was real yes but we was always told what goes in my house what stays Stays in my house house. and i disagree with that saying so much because um that is the start of um causing children in the home to have mental illness because it's so much stuff that they want to talk or say or do and it's like okay you went through it we're not going to discuss it. It gets swept underneath the rug, and that's it. There's no talking about it. Then there's no crying about it. Yeah. You're going to have to deal with it. You know what? I dealt with it growing up. You deal with it now, you know? And so that was a, that was a, a, like, oh my goodness kind of moment for me, right? right. Um, it was, you know, not just my house. So that's everybody I talked to is like, man. <laughs> That was that was our household too, right? Yeah. And so as it was growing up, it was kind of like we never really dealt with anything. I did not learn how to deal or process through issues until I got older, you know, because um, at a at a moment in time, it was like more of I went through college and the psychologist, you know, I was taking up psychology because I wanted to be a psychologist, you know, and it was like conflict is good, and I was like. What? Conflict is good? <laughs> like, wait a minute. Every time I see conflict is what? Somebody's fighting. Somebody, it was bad. Right. You know, but they said, no, healthy conflict is good. And so that's what I would say to the audience who was watching. Conflict is good when it's healthy. And healthy looks like this. You can honestly sit down and talk person to person with someone to honestly express how you're feeling Mm -hmm. at that moment in time. Giving them, hey, you made me feel like this. And so in saying that is that 
as we are going through life, conflict is going to happen no matter what. Yes. We have to sit down with our spouses, our children, our moms, our dads, our brothers, and our sisters to actually say, this is how you made me feel. And a lot of things go back to childhood. Yes. Childhood. So we will talk a little bit more with Zion after these messages. Welcome back to Healing for the Broken. If you're just now tuning in, we're interviewing Giselle Watts, a.k.a. Zion. Oh my goodness, she has talked to us so much about how life has, um, through her curveballs when she was younger, watching her father commit suicide when she was uh, three. Yes. Um, just experiencing a mother-daughter relationship um, on another kind of level. Um, and then also homosexuality, how you ended up being part of that lifestyle, but God has brought you out. So tell me more, Giselle, about um, the life lessons you have learned over the years and um, into the woman that you are today. Um, well, uh, for all the, you know, the nine churchy folk, if you remember, there was a song by Malara, and she said, experience is a good teacher. Mm. You know, and so um, what I've experienced, it has taught me um, to love, patience, endurance. Um, it's taught me how to see past what I see. Um, because a lot of times in life, what you see is not what it is. Mm. And so um, it's, it's taught me how to read behind the front cover of a book with people uh, in my life. And so that's the short version. That's the short version. Now that's a great version of the just basically summing up of, of the life lessons that, that you were taught. You know, and you really have blessed me on today. And I pray that she has blessed you all on today. Um, now, the Science Cream Shatter Pieces. Now, if you want to um, be part of the upcoming show that's coming up on when? It's coming up on October the 8th. Yay! <laughs> if I had Yay. Time, you know. ding, ding, ding. Yes, October the 8th. But it's called, you have a conference coming up as well called Prison Break. Yes. So tell us more about um, the conference and the play and how uh, people who are watching can get in contact with you. Well, we've talked tremendously about Silent Scream Shatter Pieces and what, what to expect there. Uh, prison Break is basically um, a continuation of that. We're going to be dealing with life issues, traumas, and we want people to come get healed, delivered, and set free. The team and I, we've been praying and, and prophesying to the atmosphere and believing God that people are going to come and revival is going to break out in your lives. Yes. Uh, so meet us October the 8th and the 9th, 600 Kendrick Drive. Uh, Sweet D1, that's in Houston, Texas, 77060. You can get uh, your tickets on Eventbrite underneath Prison Break. And the tickets for the actual production are $15 in advance and $25 at the door. We're super excited to have you guys to come on in uh, because we believe that the best is yet to come for your life. Oh, thank you so much, Zion, for coming on the show. We are just elated to have you here on today. Um, to everyone who's watching, God loves you. He wants all of us to come to Him, no matter what situations you might be in. He wants you to be healed. So please tune in to NDTV Network on all the social media platforms and we are joyful to be back in the studio and excited for what God is about to do in our lives and your lives as well. Thank you for watching. God bless.
Bear is my sister. I can see why you are here. Son, can you please have your seat? Dad, I will not sit down. Why don't you just calm down? Take it easy. How long are we going to continue to sit down and watch that devil that calls himself my, my own uncle? I am your uncle. You are not my uncle. You will never be my uncle. Kai, may your death be shameful. May you be rejected by vultures and may the sun cease on your grave. What? How dare you? Speed on me, Chief Martins. Boys, take heart of the dungeon. We gave you all the powers needed by you. And you are begging. We don't beg. We command. Command. Now listen to me and listen good. If you are not my son, I know what I would have done. I know I wanted a revenge for all the pains you've put me through. But no. No more. Because I am done making you the pilot of my life.